Something lurks at the heart of every galaxy, a silent engine of destruction, yet also creation. For decades, black holes have been the universe's greatest paradox, swallowing light, time, and information itself. But what if we've finally begun to understand them? I've been doing some work on black holes recently, which I hadn't started last time I saw you, actually. So I got interested in it. And the, the amount of the progress that's been made in trying to understand how they work, and, and a question that was posed by Stephen Hawking a long time ago, really 1970s, early 1980s, which is what happens to stuff that falls in. When Stephen Hawking first asked, what happens to the stuff that falls in? No one could answer. It was the simplest question in physics and the most terrifying. Today, we might finally be closer than ever. We've actually seen black holes. Not simulations, not guesses, real images. Vast cosmic monsters caught devouring light itself. So we have two photographs, which are radio telescope photographs. Right. One of the, the one in the center of our galaxy, which is a, a little one, it's called Sagittarius A star. A little, it's, a, it's a little supermassive black hole. So it's about six million times the mass of the sun, which makes it a little supermassive. <laughs> and then there's another one, the first photo that was taken, it's a collaboration called Event Horizon. And they took a, a photo of one in the galaxy M87, 55 million light years away. That thing is around six billion times the mass of the sun. I mean, imagine that, 6,000 million times more massive than our sun. Is that the largest black hole we've ever discovered? No, there, there are bigger ones than that, but that's the, 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 that, that's the scale of them. It's a big-ish one, that. But if you think about it, I mean, so there's a number. It's called the, the Schwarzschild radius of the thing. So if you, if you took our sun, which you can fit a million Earths inside, and collapsed it down to make a black hole, it would form a black hole when it shrunk within a radius of three, three kilometers, about two miles. So you've got to take this thing, which is what well, I have to convert from kilometers to miles, don't I? But it's about so that's okay. Just say kilometers. Seven hundred thousand kilometers. So it's about five five hundred thousand miles radius or something like that. The sun. So, so you squash it down till it's about two miles, and then that would form a black hole. Wow. The six billion times the mass of the sun means you multiply that by six billion. So these things, the, the so-called Schwarzschild radius, is I don't know larger than our solar system. The scale is almost beyond comprehension. The black hole at the center of M87 isn't just big. It's six billion times the mass of our sun. Its event horizon is so large, it could swallow our entire solar system. And no one would ever know. And yet, somehow, we've captured its shadow. A faint orange ring glowing against eternity, predicted by Einstein more than a century ago, confirmed by human hands. And you can predict that that's one, what one should look like. And then just about, was that four years ago now, maybe five years ago, for the first time in history, we get an image of one, and it looks like the prediction. But black holes don't just bend light. They ripple time itself. When two of them collide, they send waves across the fabric of reality. Tiny distortions in space and time that wash over everything, even the you right now. As you listen, invisible gravitational waves, echoes of ancient cosmic violence, are literally passing through you, changing the rate that time flows by less than the width of an atomic nucleus. And he calls it a storm in time. So you get a time storm. So really, we're to think, as we speak now, there will be these very tiny ripples from violent cosmic events passing through this room, and they're changing the rate that time passes so that as, as they go through. And we can detect that now. So we have detectors that can pick that up. And so we've seen those collisions as well. So these collisions, how far away? Oh, millions of light years away. And they're Indeed. affecting what's happening in this room right now? Yeah, to a tiny extent. So there's an, ex there's an experiment called LIGO, which is the... Uh, what it stands for, something like gravitational interferometer. So I can't remember exactly what the, the, the but there's, so basically it's a laser beams. And there's one in Washington state, north of Seattle, and one in Louisiana. And they're, they're kind of laser beams, four kilometer long laser beams at right angles. 
And they can detect these very tiny shifts in the, effectively, you could say the length of the laser beam. It's a bit more fiddly and complicated, but it, it essentially measures this, the, the, the distortion in space-time caused by these ripples. And it's, it's way less than the diameter of an atomic nucleus, by the way. But perhaps the most haunting question isn't what black holes do. It's what they erase. In the 1970s, Stephen Hawking made a discovery so shocking, it changed physics forever. Black holes aren't perfectly black. They glow. A faint, ghostly light leaks from their edge. What we now call Hawking radiation. A revelation so important, it's carved into his tombstone. It, in a sense, it was what's wrong with Stephen Hawking's calculation, which is a weird thing to say sometimes, because people think Stephen Hawking surely right. didn't get his math wrong. But he did, actually, in his calculation. So what he calculated back in 1973, 1974, is that a black hole, so we picture this thing from which nothing can escape, even light. So when you go in, you're gone, basically. What he calculated is that even though these things are just a distortion in space and time, so that's the description of them. So it's almost as like if there's nothing there apart from a distortion in space and time. He calculated that they glow, so they have a temperature. So they, they emit radiation, it's called Hawking radiation. And that's so important was that discovery. And if you go to Westminster Abbey in London, look on the floor of the Abbey on his memorial stone, and he's in there next to Newton and Shakespeare and all these people, and he's there. And chiselled in stone on the floor of Westminster Abbey is his equation for the temperature of a black hole. But this light revealed a deeper horror. If black holes emit radiation, they lose mass. They evaporate. Over unimaginable timescales, even the largest will fade away and vanish. So what happens to everything that fell inside? Hawking's math gave an unthinkable answer. All the information, every atom, every particle, every story that crossed the horizon is gone forever. So that means they have a lifetime. So first of all, one day they'll be gone. So that means that you have to address this question of what happened to all the stuff that fell in. And his calculation said that there's no record at all of anything that fell in, in all this radiation that's come off the black hole. So it's, it's purely information-less radiation. So what that means is that black holes destroy information, according to that calculation. And that's a big deal, because nowhere else in all of physics does anything erase information from the universe. So it's really true that if I got this, this notepad and pen, right, and I, I wrote some things on it, and then I set fire to this, even, just incinerated it, put it in a nuclear explosion, whatever. In principle, according to all the laws of nature that we know, if you collected everything that came off, all the radiation, all the bits of ashes and things, and you could just measure it all, then just in principle, the idea is you could reconstruct the information. So it all gets scrambled up and thrown out into, and so in practice, you can't do it. But in, just in principle, the laws of nature say that information is not destroyed, it's just scrambled up in a way that you can't reconstruct. This is the information paradox, a contradiction that threatens to unravel the laws of the universe. Because if information can vanish, then physics itself stops making sense. If you burn a notebook, the information isn't lost, it's just scattered. In principle, if you gathered every atom of smoke and ash, you could reconstruct what was written, but a black hole deletes the story completely. And what happens when you cross that line, the event horizon? According to Einstein, you wouldn't even notice. You'd simply fall and keep falling until you reached the end of time itself. Inside a black hole, space and time invert. What was once a place becomes a moment, and the singularity isn't a point. It's the end of tomorrow. You can't escape it for the same reason you can't run away from time. You, we could be falling through that horizon now in this room, and we wouldn't notice anything except that we couldn't get out again. And, and ultimately, 
in a few hours in, in that case, time would end for us. So we just go, you go to the end of time. We could talk about that. There's a picture of that. Maybe I should talk about that. This is getting quite complicated so we already, isn't it? We didn't, we didn't start in a relaxing way, fine. did we? I don't know. No need to. <laughs> no need to. Let's get right into it. So we wouldn't notice. Not for the big black holes. So, so yeah, so these supermassive black holes, you, you, we could fall across this horizon. It's just like being in empty space for us. Uh, so we just, we we were just be talking now and we could have been talking on the outside of the horizon and by the time I finish the sentence we could be on the inside of the horizon inside the black hole and according to Einstein's theory at least which is the theory that predicted them initially we could just do that we could just go in and we wouldn't notice for a bit the, the thing we would notice ultimately is you go inexorably you, nothing you can do you go to this thing called the singularity once you've crossed the horizon and you are going to that thing and then the question arises what is that thing and one answer is we don't know but in Einstein's theory it's the end of time so it's it, one way of picturing what's happened here is so distorted is space and time by the collapse of a star or the collapse of loads of stuff to make these big supermassive black holes we don't quite know how they form actually but it's collapsing stuff so it distorts space and time so much that, in a, in a real sense, they kind of flip over. They, they get mixed up. And so this, this singularity, which you might have thought of as the point to which this thing collapsed, this infinitely dense point, you might think, but actually more correctly to be seen as the end of time. So what really lies beyond that line? For now, no one knows. But the answers are starting to emerge and they might change everything we think we know about reality, causality, and the fabric of the universe itself. The mystery Hawking began in the 1970s is not yet solved, but each new discovery, each gravitational wave, each image, each idea, brings us closer, closer to understanding the black holes that might one day reveal the truth about everything. What did you think about today's journey? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I read every single one. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you don't miss what's coming next. We've got more strange, unsettling, and fascinating stories from the universe headed your way. Until then, stay safe and stay curious.